Good afternoon. Uh, wow, practical is what I'm all about, and that was definitely a practical demonstration. Um, how many of you learned something from that? Yeah, me too. So um, I want to talk to you a little bit about why my daughter is important and why she's not important. Um, what happened in Charlottesville was a, an awakening for a lot of the country about how violent white supremacists are willing to be in this day and time. And there are many reasons for that, which we don't need to go into today, but let's talk about what you can do when you encounter white supremacists. For one thing, they are human beings. Many of them are very lost and very angry. Does that excuse their hate? Absolutely not. But you can try to talk to them. On the day she was killed, Heather actually tried to talk to some of the white supremacist girls as they were packing up to leave. The governor had already issued a warning and called it an unlawful assembly, told everybody to leave, and Heather, who had been walking with the nonviolent counter protesters all day, decided she would go and talk to some of the girls uh, as they were leaving. One girl she tried to strike up a conversation with and say, why are you here? Can you talk to me about why you believe this way? Can you talk to me about why you hate other people? And the girl just kept saying, no comment, no comment. Now, that girl is not the one who killed Heather. The person who killed Heather was someone who felt like they had lost the battle that day and he reacted in anger. He sat at the top of the hill in his car. He had already been down that street. He backed up, sat at the top of the hill, and watched as the crowd of nonviolent protesters, who had not bothered him all day long, came up that street. Now he knew good and well there were two other cars at the bottom of the hill because he had followed one of them there. He didn't like what he saw. He didn't like the feeling that he had lost that day. And so he chose to drive his car, accelerated it over two speed bumps, down a hill, hitting the car in front of him so fast that he accelerated that car from parked to 17 miles an hour in zero seconds, immediately. My daughter spun through the air leaving skin and blood on his windshield. Her aorta was ruptured in four places. She was dead before she hit the ground. They didn't know that, so they did CPR. They got her to the ER 20 minutes later. They tried to revive her, not knowing she had been dead for 20 minutes. I'm grateful that my daughter never suffered. I'm grateful that she probably never even knew what happened. But how many parents can say that when their child is murdered? How many parents can say that the violence that took their child did not also cause their child pain? So what we're here to do today is to talk about how we can stop the pain, how we can stop the violence, how we can stop the grieving for the parents. I'm only a blip on the radar of all the parents who have ever lost a child. I hope none of you in here have ever lost a child, but statistically, it's just not possible that there is no one else in this room who has lost a child at some point, whether they were a baby, whether they were an older child, or whatever. So what can we do to deal with this violence? Well, as the Heather Heyer Foundation was formed, I only had um, a very brief time. We formed the foundation only nine days after she was killed because people from all over the world were sending us in small amounts of checks and various things. And I said to her supervisor, Alfred Wilson, who was also African American, um, what can we do to solve this? What can we do to do something responsible with this money? And so we put together the foundation initially to give scholarships to young people who are themselves activists, who are going into uh, fields of, of study that will help their activism. And so that's been our initial thing. Our next uh, 
attack on white supremacy and extremism is we have started a youth empowerment program. Uh, we just launched it in September where we have uh, kids have gotten together to work on projects that they want to do and the adults are there only to supervise and to help. The adults do not take over. The kids decide what they want to do. So one group is working on police brutality. One group is working on gender identity, doing a podcast. Um, and both of those groups are doing podcasts. One group uh, decided they wanted to work on environmental issues and so forth and so on. And so um, we meet once a month with them um, to make that happen. Like I said, this is a pilot program because we're hoping to roll this out to other high schools. We've had a lot of requests from high schools around the United States to get this program up and going and a few from other countries even and I just said, hang on, I'm not quite ready yet. We just started. Um, we're also working on how to have difficult conversations because in the same way that Heather was able to talk to that young lady that day to try to help her explain and as a way of explaining, Heather knew darn well, because this is what she did all the time, that if you can get somebody to talk about what they believe, and it looks pretty foolish in the light of day, they'll back off of it. So um, we're working now on how to have people talk to one another, how to use the same kind of understanding language. I've heard it said um, that one political party will call it uh, working on the environment, another political party will call it national resources, and yet they mean the, exactly the same thing. So let's learn to speak one another's language, let's learn to understand one another, and try to get some understanding. Because in my experience, violence comes out of a sense of frustration, violence comes out of a sense of helplessness, violence comes out of a sense of rage that often comes from not having what you need, not feeling like you're heard, not feeling like you're cared about. So if we can make connections with people, if we can touch uh, points with one another to say um, what we have in common, then we can find those points of connection. I'm a short, fat, white woman. Um, most people, when they look at me and I go, I'm from Hillbilly Roots, they go, uh huh, yeah, mm -hmm. thought so. Um, I live in a single wide trailer. I've lived in a single wide trailer since 1995 as a school teacher with two small children. I was a single mom back then. It's all I could afford. Mm -hmm. And I don't really have the money to move out and it's not really a priority. I'm 62, almost 63. I'll be 63 in a week. Um, <laughs> hey, it's a miracle I made it this long. So uh, um, I listen to heavy metal. I like rock, classic rock and roll, um, and people often look at me and they're surprised because that's not who they thought I was. If I never opened my mouth, you might not know that about me. I played classical piano for five years. I started, studied opera in college, very briefly. Wasn't my thing, but I tried it. <laughs> My point is, if we can allow ourselves to be transparent with other people, we can find those points of connection. If we can find those points of connection, we can sit down and have some conversation with people. We can avoid the hatred, we can avoid the violence if we can find a way to make those connections. So I encourage you today, as you go out into your neighborhoods, as you go out into your communities, try to talk to your neighbors. I'm not good at that. I've managed to live in a trailer park all those years by kind of keeping to myself. But I can tell you when I married my current husband five years ago, six years ago, he made all the friends because we get out there and we make those points of connection. Allow yourselves to do that. Thank you very much.